because string theorists are extremely bright and they're and they know it and they're arrogant. Okay, that's a generalization. It's generally true. I just spoke to Kamran Vafa, who is the head string theorist at Harvard. I liked your Kaku conversation, by the way, your Michio Kaku conversation. Thank you. He was he was awesome. He was a real, you know, the guy. Obviously, like there's a lot of arguments around string theory and stuff like that within science and righteously so science should be worked out in, in that there should be different factions trying to figure out which idea is better and so he's always caught in the middle of that but what a humble guy and true gentleman and total machine i mean he's like 77 years old now i think 77 78 and i'm telling you that podcast was three hours long because i had to stop aha uh -huh. he would have gone for 12 hours man he, he came down, it was, I was still in my parents' house at the time. He came down on a Saturday morning. He's like, okay, let's go. And he's just a total all business machine. It was really, really amazing to watch, but it was, it was, it was very cool to, to pick the brain of, of a guy who's got a lot of ideas that people fight over, but also is, you know, definitely true, true brilliance mm -hmm. to find. So now I, I don't, okay, well, I had some negative comments and That's I, okay. I Go don't for know it. if I should, Do not about it. you, Do but it. about him. And I just had said that I don't want to say anything negative when someone's not here. So I understand how you think. Don't okay. I'll just tell it. you about Go what ahead. he said that I disagree with. Please. It's not negative about him. I don't agree with what he said. You're not attacking him. Yes. No, no, no. People know where, where your heart's at. He said, <laughs> there's, okay. People don't dislike string theory. People dislike string theorists. And mm. that's different because string theorists are extremely bright and they're and they know it and they're arrogant. Okay, that's a generalization. It's generally true. I just spoke to Kamran Vafa, who is the head string theorist at Harvard. Head string, he's the head of the of the theoretical physics department, the chair. Okay. People say string theory is the only game in town. That sounds like something that people from outside the string community would say to capture the the sanctimony of the string theory of people, but it's not something they would say. It's something you tell them, hey, you guys think you're the only game in town. Uh, yeah. No, they say that. Kamran Vafa explicitly said, and other string theorists like Brian Green and I don't know if him on my podcast, but other string theorists have said, it's the only game in town. If you're working on something else, you have a low IQ and you're ignorant. That's their view. That's a so problem. People... Don't, string theory is fantastic. I did this three hour, so I did a, a, a deep dive that I thought would only be 10 minutes to 20 minutes. Then the script went up to 30 minutes, <laughs> then one hour, then one yeah. and a half, then two, then two and a half to three hours long. And I had to cut material where I did a technical deep dive. It's called the iceberg of string theory. Because mm. few people, including myself, myself prior to this, I would just criticize string theory just because I'm spouting an opinion that I've heard from other people. Much like, much like the hermeneutics of beauty. People spout that and they don't realize they're just living off of the dead matter of, of Nietzsche and Marx and Freud. And they think they're thinking for themselves, but they're just these little parasites on someone else's body. I'm a critical thinker and everything just comes fed to them from some unknown source. So I was similar with string theory until I started to look into it. And it's fascinating. It is a fantastic mathematical framework. It's elegant, it's natural. It's in some ways beautiful, although I wouldn't use that term. I don't use that. I, I take back. It's beautiful. It's natural. Real, real quickly, just for people listening, I know a lot of people out there know string theory. They've known it from previous conversations I've had on here, but can you just quickly define it for those who are listening for the first time? String theory says what you... Okay, the way that science worked before was we have objects here. And then someone said, maybe they're atoms. And then Einstein showed there is a way that you can actually test for atoms. Okay, so then we're like, okay, objects comprise atoms. And then you find out what we thought of as an atom isn't, atom actually means like indecomposable. You yeah, can't decompose yeah. it. You can, it's called subatomic particles. Okay, so let's say you have an electron. Is an electron fundamental? The string theorist would say, what you think of as a point particle is actually either a something that should be modeled as a one-dimensional just curve or a loop. Okay, so closed string versus an open string. That's mm -hmm. string theory. That's the genesis of string theory. Now, why is string theory so lauded, so liked in the mathematical physics community? 
most people would say it's soci sociological and reasons of power. This is Eric Weinstein, Sabine Hassenfelder would say something similar. The way that I view it is different. Physics is like whack-a-mole. So in other words, there are different problems that come up. Okay, so I'll give you an example prior to string theory. So Dirac, or I can give you an Einstein example or a Dirac example. Which one would you like? Can we do Einstein? Sure. Is that cool? Yeah. So Einstein said, okay, I have this idea. Acceleration and gravity are the same. It's called the strong equivalence principle. It doesn't matter. I, acceleration and gravity are the same. Cool. I have that idea. Okay. Problem. How do I make this work with a scalar field? He wanted something called a scalar potential. What that is? Doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. He wanted it to work. So that's like a little mole that comes up. He whacks it down. He says, okay, maybe the reason I can't make this work is because I relied on space time, my previous theory, and I need to go back to space. It was a mistake to break, to unite space and time. Mm. Okay. Okay. But then problem crops up. You have to introduce a variable speed of light. So then he's like, okay, let me knock that down. Forget about scalars. Let me introduce tensors, a different mathematical object. So then you don't have conservation of momentum. So he's like, oh, shoot. Okay, I have to add some other term now. You knock that down. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, the, the, no, that, that actually works, but then it turns out to not be consistent co cosmologically, so he adds another term. Okay, so the point is that you constantly have problems you're solving. Oh, you don't have linearity anymore. He wanted linearity, so now his, his solution is much more difficult, so it's nonlinear. Mm. Oh, to the point he couldn't even solve his own equation except in, in one small case with Mercury. He had to make an approximation. It took someone else in the trenches of World War II who I don't, no one knows how he did this, He's in the trenches and he comes up with a solution to Einstein's equation. Einstein thought that there would never be a solution, like an actual exact solution, a non-perturbative solution is the technical term, meaning an exact solution without approximations. Mm. Okay, but someone did like two years later. Yeah, in that's the a wild story. One year later, one year, his name is Schwarzschild. Schwarzschild? Schwar Schwarzschild. The first black hole is a Schwarzschild black hole. Then someone named Kerr came out and said, well, black holes could rotate and have charge and then but Schwarzschild basically invented this. Wow. In the trenches, died a few, few, years, few years later. Young, I believe. Okay. Dirac also had something similar with whack-a-mole. So he's like, okay, I don't like Klein-Gordon's equation, which is Schrodinger's relativistic equation. It means Schrodinger plus Einstein equals Klein-Gordon. Yeah. Dirac is like, I don't like that. It has negative energies. So it's maybe the problem. Okay. He knocks something down. It's a second order equation that maybe, oh, maybe linearity is the solution. Knock something down. Something else comes up. Oh, your scalars, which Einstein was dealing with before, can't be scalars. They have to be matrices. Okay, two by two? Psh, nope. Four by four? Okay, four by four works. Thank God. What do I do with my mass? Oh, okay. It, you multiply it by an identity matrix. So another, sim okay, psh, knock that down. Oh, I actually still have negative energies. So what happens is in physics, the history of physics is the history of trying to solve problems more creep up. And so your theory becomes more and exactly. more tortuous. And then you knock more and more down. So the to protect it, yeah. So because you have some idea and you're just you're exploring and you you don't want to abandon it. Okay, now string theory comes. Why is string theory successful? So string theory came about from there were a, co a collection of atom a collection of particles called hadrons, and there was no organizing principle. So you just throw them all on the desk and you're like, well, how do I make sense of these? Where do these guys come from? Turns out these can make s oh. Okay, here's, here's one way of thinking about it. So let's say you have a circle here. You have a circle. If you're, if ma Imagine there's just two axes, mass and spin. Mm -hmm. And you plot them and they all align on the circle. Then you could say, oh, maybe they're related by U1, which means rotation, just rotates. Like these particles, maybe they're all akin to the same particle, just rotated. Mm. Okay, that's something you could say. Like you've, you think, oh, well, that's just an arbitrary plotting. You just put it down. You happen to find a circle. Okay, but that's, Sometimes how physics works. So you put these hadrons on the table. Turns out you don't put them on a 2D plane. You put them on something higher dimensional, and you realize it's not the group U1. It's not a circle group. It's something called SU3. What is that? Doesn't matter. It's just some rotation group. Okay, cool. We have, so that's a solution. Great. We've found a way to model particles, SU3. Okay, now what? How do we 
calculate with this. That's called the amplitude, scattering amplitude problem. Okay, so Veneziano comes up with something called the, the scattering amplitude for SU3. Okay, but then the problem is, well, that's the solution. The problem is, how do you interpret that amplitude? So the solution is, oh, maybe there's strings. Then the problem is, and now I'm skipping because it actually didn't work like this historically. It was abandoned and then came back, but this makes the narrative much easier. Understood. Problem is, those strings have to operate in something like 26 dimensions. Okay, problem. Then another problem is that they're just bosons, these force-carrying particles, like enforcer particles that come about and tell you, you must do something. They're, they're bullies. They're these bully particles called... Yeah, yeah. Okay called gluons in this case. Yep. No, sorry, not in this case. Something else. I'd be stopping there. you every half sentence okay. if we were asking follow-up questions. Okay, great, so great, great. some of this, as long as it's staying broadly followable, which I think it is, okay. we're okay. And but I'll for people out uh, there, I just don't want to be cutting. I will simply, this is super simple. The point is, it turns out in order for string theory to work, it needs to be 26 dimensional. And it only had bosons at this point in the story. Okay, why don't we add something called supersymmetry so we knock it down. Okay, cool problem there's still many types of string theory and now there's 10 dimensional not four dimensional but it's some progress okay solution you combine some heterotic strings okay problem we still have five and we have gauge anomalies gauge anomalies mean it, it doesn't matter there's so, it's a problem okay. then something else happens in 1984 green and schwartz mechanism meaning that you have a gauge anomaly you have an anomaly you've heard this about eric weinstein's theory it has an anomaly a so-called anomaly to me the fact that a theory has an anomaly isn't a point against the theory in the same way that string theory had an, had an anomaly and it just required people to work on it to find a clever workaround. So mm. green and short, so string theory was abandoned for a couple of years because there was an anomaly. When was like that? 1981, 1982. Mm. And even Ed Witten found an SU2 anomaly and then a gravitational anomaly. And he wasn't a string theorist before. He was working in various fields and what he got the fields medal, the mathematical version of the Nobel prize for isn't string theory. Many people think it's string theory. It's topological quantum field theory. It's working with something like knots and then relating that to quantum fields as well. Mm. It was a genius. And he just, after that, he continued to come out with more and more and more and more. Oh my gosh, man. We can talk about that. The point is green and Schwartz canceled the anomaly. Then it turns out, okay, well, how do we, we still have five flavors. Okay, we make it to M theory. Okay, but then how do you perfectly describe M theory? Okay, you need matrix models. Okay, but now we're still in ADS, blah, blah, blah. That's string theory. It's that there's these guys that crop up, you hit them down. So now how is that, how is that a reason for it to be valid? Like, why does that mean that it's powerful? It doesn't. What's, in, what's different about string theory is that sometimes when you knock down these little gophers yeah yeah there's a ding 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 in the background and you look and it's mathematical gold so when you're working with string theory and you're solving some problems all of a sudden some new field comes up called mirror symmetry that you had to invent in string theory and it has so much mathematical insight to it so much that in 1994 this guy named maxim konsevich takes it makes homological string theory another huge field which then comes back to string theory hit down another one ding 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 Vertex operator algebras. They ding, have ding, to ding, keep ding. creating buttresses. Yes, Witten invariance. Ding ding ding. Thomas Donaldson invariance. The only time that's ever happened in physics is when there was something to it, like with Dirac. Ding 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 ding. Dirac operators years later came about index theory. Thank you for watching the video, guys. If you haven't already subscribed, please smash that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.